Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. And for those of you that have no idea why we're talking on the mic, um, we're doing a book signing for Connor. It's his second memoir. And we really appreciate you making it out. We are just hot off the, uh, the uh, hot off of uh, the writers' conference in Santa Barbara, and we've had like one week of promoting. And it's so nice to be here locally with Conan's first in-person book signing for this. So a little bit about myself. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay. We want to first thank Wildworks for allowing us to have this event. We've got Dylan and Dylan behind the bar. I've heard amazing things about this place, and we just, I, I love the vibe here. They have all sorts of live music, and they have book signings, and music. So a little bit about myself is, my name is Rachel Sarah Thurston, and I am the owner of State of Sparkle, which is an author branding, marketing, and accountability coaching service. I've been working with Connor over the past two years, as his coach for all things author and publishing and marketing and over this time we've become very dear friends and it's been an absolute joy working with Connor. In the house we also have Dale Griffith Stamos who is also a dear friend. The three of us make an incredible team. <laughs> Dale is the unsung hero, an incredible editor who introduced us initially. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, after we, I do the interview, we're gonna have a Q&A, and we're also recording this to put it up on YouTube eventually. Connor has his first book here as well, which is called Once Upon a Kentucky Farm, and it's about growing up in rural Kentucky. Um, and there is a theme of trauma with both books. He grew up in a very abusive household with an alcoholic father who also had PTSD from being a vet in the World War II. So I, I also wanted to share that if you do enjoy the book, please, the best thing you can do besides coming to these events is taking a moment, just a couple of minutes, to write a review on Amazon or Goodreads or any place where people read reviews. It really goes a long way for indie, indie authors like Connor. So I'll be asking Connor about his process writing the memoir. I'll do my best to not reveal any spoilers. You do know he made it back from Vietnam, thank goodness. So, yeah. So thank goodness for that, because we would have no book. So Barbara Brothels and Bombs in the Night, Surviving Vietnam, is Connor's second memoir, and it picks up a couple of years after Once Upon a Kentucky Farm ends. At the young age of 19 years old, in 1968, and during the height of the Vietnam War, Connor dropped out of engineering school. Though it was a distinct possibility in his mind, the reality of being drafted to serve in Vietnam didn't really hit him until he received the draft papers later that year. This compelling journey, and you want to hold up the book so they can see how gorgeous this book is. <laughs> This compelling journey, thanks Conrad, follows him through his service in Vietnam as a young intelligence analyst thrust into the rigid discipline of the military and the violent uncertainty and chaos of the war in Southeast Asia. Angry, resentful, and coursing with the raging hormones of a young man, he does his best to survive and make his way back home from finding companionship in the darkened corners of brothels to surviving mortar attacks in the middle of the night, Connor struggles to maintain his moral compass in a foreign culture, to face his inner demons, questions what it means to truly become a man, and examines his own beliefs around the meaning of being an American as a conscripted soldier during wartime. Though he does survive Vietnam, he was surprisingly changed, he was unsurprisingly changed by his experience and returned to the U.S., haunted, bruised, traumatized, and suffering from anxiety, bouts of rage, and suicidal ideations. The experience of suffering trauma from Vietnam eventually leads him to a college counselor, Ms. Edith Alpi, who he did dedicate this book to in the beginning, who helps him during his darkest hours and to whom he dedicated this book. As a result of having experienced trauma from his childhood and serving in Vietnam, 
He pursues a 25-year career as a therapist, specializing in treating alcoholics, addicts, and those suffering from major psychiatric disorders like PTSD. Ultimately, Connor discovers that it's not in the forgetting of trauma, but in the courageous remembering that true healing can begin. So Connor, do you want, before I dive in, do you want to read the scene at the very beginning of you sitting in this is um, at the very early on in the book after he's been drafted and he's still pretty much shell-shocked and he said goodbye to his family and he had no idea if he'd be making it back and he's on this bus and he's at the beginning of serving in two year two two year um, service well, this was a scene I'm waiting with my parents in, in our car in front of the draft board building, waiting for a bus. And I'm going to board it. I wanted to avoid a mom meltdown. I wanted to stay strong and say to her, I'll be okay. I wanted to tell her not to worry, but I couldn't. Doubt swirled about the decisions that had led me to my current circumstance, and dread mixed with sadness over departing from the two people always nearby. I was about to go into the future where new possibilities would lead me into manhood or a body bag. <laughs> so I had a question for you going through this scene is I thought if you could go back to that bus to the 20 year old Connor and give him advice that you wish someone had given you, what would it be? Um, if, I, if I could convince him that I knew the future, <laughs> I would tell him, you'll survive. Um, regardless, I tell him, try to find someone who is at least wiser than you, who you can confide in while you're there, and talk to them about what's going on for you, so that you're not alone in your experience. So, I want to bring up, in the title, we have barbed wire, brothels, and bombs. So. If it's not clear, this is definitely an X-rated, it's an R-rated book. It's not a G-rated book. And not as, for children. No, not for children. And just a little bit of a trigger warning as well, is that as a woman reading this book, it was fascinating for me and also jolting at times around your visits to brothels and consequential interactions with prostitutes. I will say for those of you that haven't read this book, um, one of the ongoing themes is around toxic masculinity of serving in the military during Vietnam. So this is especially evident in the attitudes of the men that you're serving with towards women, um, both American and non-American. What warnings would you give everyone here before reading this book about any triggers? Well, I would say I wanted to be honest and candid. I didn't want to soft soak anything about my experience. And Though I wasn't deliberately trying to be crude, I just wanted to be honest about my experience and hoping that that would provide a pathway for others to be honest with themselves about their own experiences. So if you've read his first book, and Dale's very familiar with the first book, it is really admirable how Connor really digs into being vulnerable and courageously honest he doesn't sugarcoat who he is in many moments, and it's something that I admire about him. I know there are several of you out there who are writers, and it's quite scary when you're writing nonfiction and you're writing a memoir because you're really naked to the world. So what was the most difficult experience, what was the most difficult part of your experience in the Army and in Vietnam? I think the most difficult part was Knowing I was subject to injury or death any moment that I was in Vietnam. I had reports about casualties in Vietnam in the news constantly before I'd gone in, um, weekly totals of casualties. So I had been seared in my head. And I had also heard in advanced individual training that this is a quote no matter where you are in Vietnam, you're at the front. So that was the most difficult part. That stress, that concern was always weighing on me. And there was only a few moments of flashes that I forget it. And we went back just like that. 
Um, not being able to talk to people, again, not having a lot of counselors available. Um, even though I was around other people, I had the camaraderie of being with men or boys my age, and then there was the, the issue of sex and the alcohol as a way to try to escape that stress. But it wasn't the same as truly being able to talk about what was going on in the well, speaking of mental health, I was really stunned by the statistics on how many U.S. veteran suicides there are in the U.S. And I can tell from some, have you read the book? Yeah, <laughs> it was really sobering. You shared that between 2008 and 2017, you can come through and grab a drink if you want, it's fine. <laughs> between 2008 and 2017, 60,000 American veterans committed suicide, which is more than the whole number of vets that died in Vietnam. So that's veterans from all wars, surviving veterans. 60,000 American veterans committed suicide between 2008 and 2017. Thank you for the dramatic <laughs> reaction. That's exactly what we want. That's insane. It's insane. And we clearly have a mental health crisis among our veterans. So what mental health services do you think the U.S. should offer to actively serving and formerly active veterans? Well, I know now that the uh, Veterans Association has um, on their tape recordings when you call, um, if you feel into a suicide call, call the suicide hotline. So that wasn't going on when I was a veteran. They didn't have that. Um, the only thing we had at the time, advice-wise, was go talk to the chaplain. And that equates to religion, so a lot of people, I think, were turned off by that idea. But we didn't have counselors, per se, unless, for some reason, something was quite serious, you might see a psychiatrist, but if you wanted to go talk about the feelings of psychiatrists. Um, so the cards were stacked against being able to be open and honest about it um, with anyone in the Army. We didn't, they didn't talk about it as far as, if you're having issues, go talk, come to a seminar or whatever. They didn't offer those uh, services. I think they're doing more about it now. Um, but yet there are many veterans who served then and who have served since that time, Iraq and Afghanistan, who are so alienated, they won't follow up to do anything. So there are a lot of people still suffering um, and they just don't have the word thought of to reach out themselves. So it requires a friend or family to help them do that. As someone that's been in the therapy field for 25 years, do you think there's more awareness now with PTSD? Because I get the sense that PTSD wasn't even coined at the time or wasn't even a mainstream definition I in the late 60s and early 70s. Yeah, I'm not sure when it was first uh, recognized in the diagnostic statistics manual. Um, however, um, I think it's generally underestimated in our, in our population. I don't know. And if you end up reading both of Conard's books, there is such a powerful theme of healing from trauma. It's it ultimately through all of the trauma that he experienced in his house and in Vietnam. It's really a tale of hope and giving hope because he. I mean, he committed his life to helping helping people, and now he's written these great testaments to surviving trauma and going on to live a very fulfilled, vibrant life. So on the flip side of trauma, how did you personally benefit from serving in the military? I didn't see it at the time, but looking back, I benefited by being able to be in a different culture, to see that there's more than just the American culture. Our culture is one of many in the world, and beliefs we have are fairly narrow compared to all the possibilities around the world. I benefited when I was discharged with an honorable discharge of the GI Bill as far as being able to go back to school. So I completed my undergraduate degree and then I went on to complete a master's degree using the GI Bill. Um, and I think, I think it, it gave, it, it broadened my world, not only being in the culture, but being around other people. I got to meet a lot of people. You've gone on to travel a bunch, too. I think some of your Rotarians may know this, but others may not. Conard 
We'll talk at the end about his next book, but you just got back from the Middle East. You've been all around the world with your wife, and it is it is really nice to see that it broadened your, your mind in those ways and gave you a zest for travel so early on. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you can check out some of his travel blogs on his website, conardhogan.com. That was not an intentionally placed plug, but I'm just thinking about some of my favorite blogs of his are the top 10 most unexpected things about Iceland or about, you know, the Middle East, and they're really fabulously quirky fun. So throughout the book, you struggled with feelings of anger, frustration, and hopelessness around maintaining your sense of individuality within the military during your service. And for those of you that know Conard, he's very, very bright and very individual and stubborn, <laughs> which are some of his best qualities. So what are your feelings around how the military treated you as a soldier? Well, I, I'm sure, I know the military, I believe the military did it for the right reason, and if they still do it for the right reasons that they want to toughen people up to be in combat. Um, but the process is to tear somebody down and build them back up so that they follow orders without question on a moment's notice, instinctively. Um, I didn't like that. I didn't think I needed to be torn down at all. All I needed to be informed or instructed or taught was to how to carry a weapon and if you're given them to follow it. So that's the part that I didn't like about that. I felt like, uh, I, I had enough sense <laughs> to know how to dodge a bullet and follow the order. And so they didn't have to criticize or condemn me or demean me in any way, but they did. And I didn't, that's one part about the authority I didn't like. I would have had a very hard time as well from many of the things that they made you do, I would not have handled that well. And so. <laughs> You once told me, this was very powerful when I first started working with Connor, and I meant to say earlier on that it has been such a journey working with him and becoming friends. You really get to know each other. It's very intimate when you're coaching someone, you're working with them on a creative project that's so close to their heart. And I've, I've really come to admire Connor, be inspired by his drive, his intelligence, his insatiable curiosity to learn. And there's some conversation we had the first time we met, and I had been taught to say to a veteran, thank you for your service. And so at the end of our first Zoom call, I said, thank you for your service. And Connor very gently said, it was a learning opportunity in that moment. He said, could I suggest that you instead say, welcome home? And I'm getting chills talking. I'm getting chills talking about it. And we 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 got a little more granular um, in our conversation with our virtual book launch on this. I would love for you to explain why this phrase "Welcome Home" means more to you as someone who served in Vietnam than just saying "Thank you for serving." Okay. In my experience, and I'm making a leap here, that a lot of times people will say thank you for your service as a road statement, not how are you? And they don't really have the feelings behind it. And they, they, it's as if they don't have the time, it's not that they don't care, but they don't have the time to listen to a response. Um, so that's one piece. I saw a movie not long ago, about three or four years ago, at the Santa Barbara Film Festival, and the film was entitled Bastard's Road. <laughs> Uh, featuring a Iraqi vet, American, Iraqi war vet. He, I think he probably served one or two tours there. Came home with PTSD and had, was having a difficult time. So somehow it was planned to film him going around the country visiting friends and families, his compatriots and families of those he'd lost as a way to try to heal. And he said it meant more to him to say welcome home because of that alienation he felt when he returned to the United States. That strikes me as something that's even more so for Vietnam vets, because we didn't get that welcome home that World War II vets got, or maybe even since yeah. some of the Iraqi or Afghan war vets got. Um, and so I'd like to read just a little bit here, if I may. Let's see. Okay, so uh, this is my return to the States, and we were given 30 days leave 
after retirement if we if we were continuing in the military before we had to report to our next assignment. And so I arrived at the airport in my hometown, Louisville, and there's a few of my family. Um, maybe a total of 10 people. And they're asking me questions and saying hello and hope you know that. I had no simple answers for the questions, though provided them shortcut responses. Nothing of my overall experience had been that easy to comprehend and sort through, much less put into words. I had no way to explain them in terms they understand, not in the deepest way that I had known it. I suspected no GI could. Relieved to be away from Nam, my brain told me I didn't have to expect a, mortar, a rocket or mortar attack. Didn't have to expect to hear someone scream the word incoming. I saw clues all around me from the clothes people wore to the absence of trash littering the floor. Everything appeared newer and brighter in color. I detected no heavy smells of mold or rot filling warm humid air. Everyone spoke words I understood. My bones told me otherwise, however. Nothing quite right. Everything felt familiar, though different. Rather, everything reminded me of Vietnam, a queer reversal of the previous 12 months when I hadn't been able to avoid thoughts of home everywhere I looked. Not from the presence of familiar things, but their absence. His writing is so powerful and beautiful. So what is the takeaway that you would like readers to have from reading this book? The takeaway. And you were well, I can wax a while. You were giving me a takeaway, you know, to actually, your answer on that, mm -hmm. the memoir panel. You were given permission, by the way, to share that person's name. Oh, OK. Um, I'm not sure where I am with that. Um, Repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're, there's so many angles to take this yeah. around. So, how about within the context of trauma and healing? What is the takeaway that you'd like to have? Well, the takeaway when someone is, reads this book. The, the takeaway is most people won't want to hear this. I think we're all traumatized in some way or another. And we all had trauma I know you can relate to. But I think as a culture, we tend to minimize it. We want to avoid it and, and forget it and go away. We want to have fun and enjoy life. Uh, the takeaway is that everyone, uh, no one has to go on their journey alone. And I'll read a quote from Brene Brown which I have on my website, on one of my pages. One day, you will tell your story of how you overcame what you went through, and it will be, be someone else's survival guide. And I, kind of the last bit of the book was, let me read that to you. I want to say to all our veterans, welcome home. And to everyone struggling with their version of trauma, regardless of its source, you don't need to face your demons alone. That's beautiful. Thank you. Have you had anyone specifically tell you that it had an impact on them? On yes, I did. <laughs> oh, that was your hand earlier. <laughs> <laughs> The women can see me like okay. leading you uh, down the chute there. <laughs> I will say, Rachel's mother knows me, and I'm in a critique group with, with Rachel's mother, Karen. And after reading my first book, um, she was encouraged to join a support group for her trauma. So I sit, I sit at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference and the memoir panel. I had hoped at one point, if nothing else, if only one person was helped by my book. That was my goal, and so my goal has been achieved, one person. Yay! And I know she will not be the last. <laughs> she did give him permission to share her name because he spoke about this at the conference on the memoir panel. So Connor, what's your next creative project? Oh boy. <laughs> well, I think it's ambitious for me. It's not necessarily a memoir, it's not a straight memoir. I don't want it to be a travel log either, so it's gonna be some combination somehow of something 
that involves my climbing mountains and hiking. Um, I've been to the highest point in every U.S. state, as well as the lowest. I've been to a number of world-class mountains, Aconcagua, Kilimanjaro. So I'm hoping to have a, 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 an adventure, but also looking at my motivations, why I kind of hung myself out in those risky situations at times. So hopefully it'll be compelling from both angles. And every time I finish one of his books, I, I came inside when I finished Once Upon a Kentucky Farm, and I immediately told my husband, I cannot wait to read his Vietnam memoir. And you don't think of like being excited to read a, a, a book about trauma from a war, but his book, his reading is just so powerful and easy. Um, so before we do the Q&A, I just wanted to um, share that, uh, so after we do the Q&A, any of you that want to purchase either book, please, you're welcome. And he also have a, a sign up list as well for his quarterly newsletters. He will not bombard you by any means. He only sends them out four times a year and he has really lovely updates and stories. And he also, a little brag here, he was just on the memoir panel at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference, and he won a travel writing award, um, gosh, this last uh, month ago. So this award? Yeah, from Traveler's Tales, so I'm so excited. I'm living vicariously through him <laughs> on all of that. <laughs> so um, it, we'd love to open this up to any questions that any of you might have. Yes? Uh, Connor, this is very vivid, experiential. I felt like I was almost in Vietnam. That's what I was going for. I, I really did. And I'm a person, all I did was experience when my friends dying and helicopter crashes and I told you all of that. I mean, I really did. And I'm wondering, is it because the trauma brings back to me? I mean, this was a lot of years ago. Did you take a diary? How did you remember some of these details? Well, I think that's a function of the level of the brain raisability. I, a lot of it I had submer allowed to submerge and push down for the longest and I started writing um, my climbing manuscript and then set that aside. I wasn't getting very far in this, so I started writing my one story I think was triggered in an adult education writing class. And so I wrote one about being on uh, gardening. And I started reading, writing that, and, and I remembered something else. And then I remember something else. And before you know, it's like, I think I can write a book about this, a memoir. And my technique is usually to sit at my computer. Early on, I didn't have one, but I have noise canceling headphones now, and I listen to music. And if I listen to music that's around that same time period, that helped me concentrate a little bit more. And my whole point, <laughs> I like to write scenes using sensory input. Um, so I just kept focusing on that, going back to the editing and focusing on the editing. So trying to make it as, I tried to seek into that experience to relive it as much as I could, recalling it, and then put that on paper. Just a follow-up, I'm sorry. I, you said senses, and I, I wrote it. And the third one says, I can see, smell, hear, and actually touch the earth. How did you capture that? Do you have any idea? <laughs> well, maybe you could ask. <laughs> I asked, asked, <laughs> did you capture it? I mean, you really did. You're Your right. sensing was yes. amazing. And I think that is a distinctive character in the writing. Yeah, I, I, I think that's one of my strengths as a writer. So I'm not sure I can tell you exactly how I did it. <laughs> that is honestly what every writer wants to hear, especially nonfiction. That's just, it's so beautiful to hear, and you're right. He does it in his first book as well. Did, uh, did you have, do you, you didn't have journals? From, did you listen to music that you used to listen to to jog memories, or? For the Vietnam manuscript, yes. You did, okay. Was there a song that really? It's a great technique for writers. That's, thank you for that. And I hope that you can try with your review again. There was a glitch with Amazon. That was fabulous. I worked hard on it. That happened 
to someone else we know. And we got to keep keep at it with Amazon right now. Go ahead. Let me repeat it so the, this catches it, because otherwise I'd have to do the mic. So she was asking, how difficult was it for you to revisit that trauma, and did you need help and a therapist moving through those memories? Sometimes I think I'm reverse engineering anything in my life. Um, when I started writing this book, most of the, the charge behind those experiences was already, I already dealt with. As a therapist working with drug and alcohol recovery 20 years, 20, 25 years ago, uh, well now it's longer than that. But when I first started out working in drug and alcohol treatment, we had a ther we had our own staff support group that we would spend talking about our issues. We could talk about anything we wanted to. The idea was to use the same techniques as we were using the clients to emote. Uh, so I and since. Uh, I wouldn't say dump. I uh, emptied my reservoir of pain, a, a good part of it, no, a good part of it in that process without even saying the words. It's like pain is pain, this pain is connected to that pain. If you're feeling the pain, you don't necessarily need to talk about that. You can talk about this, and it still does the same thing. So I emptied that reservoir, um, and the moat motivation for writing the book was more like crystallizing the thoughts that I had about Vietnam, putting them on paper, of crystallizing. It was another way, another avenue to uh, heal from it too. So a lot of that emotional pain was already handled. Yeah. Some still there. Okay, my question is, while you in Vietnam and experiencing the trauma, did you ever like see someone that was worse off than you and they talked to you? I mean, I'm wondering what possessed you to go from training as an engineer, which is so logical and so factual, and so one plus one equals two, and then you you like turned into this very subjective field where you have the desire to help someone and you know that it's not like, there's not like science, like I can go to Joe and do X and he will heal. It's like what you did was so from logic to hope. I mean, what prompted that change? When he was feared to another? Yeah. <laughs> what prompted the change? It was, it's a complex answer. I mean, I can make it complex and long, but I, I, will, I will keep it brief. I dropped out of engineering school because I lost my dream to become an astronaut. For one reason, this. Eyeballs. Another reason, my grades weren't all that good, and I didn't want to flunk out. So I made a decision. And then, um, when I was in Vietnam, I could see the poverty uh, that they lived in, and somehow that harkened back to the, 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 the poverty that I grew up around and, and that I expected was around the U.S., and I wanted, I, for whatever reason I can say, I wanted to be of service or help to other people, that I thought I was better off than they are, and maybe they need a hand up for a helping hand. Um, so I decided at that point to get into something like social work. I wasn't exactly sure. It turned out I became a very better therapist. Close. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you're 
in the combat that somehow you're somehow you're going to come home with less worry or less trauma than the person. Now it's a different kind of trauma, granted, but one of the things you should be careful about, I'm gonna ask about you too, but one of the things you should be careful about is this realization that, that bizarre experience of being in war, no matter what your goal is, is in itself traumatic for a variety of reasons, not the least of which you could get still killed in any given moment. But also it's the other aspects. And then that that leads to rather naturally, the other aspect is that you're a boy in the war. And that was a huge part of this book, a boy in the war. In other words, guess what? You're coming into manhood in a very warped way. And one of his reasons he writes about the war out there that is that he's in, you know, he's got the hormones What does he do with them? He can't be around the only relationship in the world. And so it's sort of again, it gets warped. So um, talk about those two aspects. Let me, um, for the recording, um, I didn't mean to do it with Kala, because you obviously meant for theater with your yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yes. I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna paraphrase just so we have it on the record. Dale asked you to address two aspects of the book. And one is the very profound misconception that not being on the front lines somehow means that you're safer and being an intelligence analyst still had these crazy amount of fear and trauma associated with it. The other aspect that Dale was bringing up is how you were just a little kid. You were 20 when you got on the, 20, right? When you got on the bus. Uh, yes, 20. But you were 19 when you got the draft, okay. So, and that occurred to me too when I was reading it. It's so young, so young, so. Well, uh, Keeping it short, um, there is evidence, and I think we can all relate to this, you don't have to be the direct recipient of, a, of a abuse or a uh, traumatic, um, tra trauma-producing event. All you need to do is be a witness to it. If you see it directly, you can even see it in a movie. You can see it on the news. Um, you could hear it and not see it perhaps even smell. You can see the aftermath of it. And that in itself is traumatic. Um, I'm not sure that answers the question. There's a lot of, I'm sure a lot of research about that, about uh, trauma. And each person deals with experiences in a different way. A lot of times we may not recognize that it's traumatic. Uh, for it to be traumatic. And, it, and it, if we don't empty that reservoir of pain that we talked about earlier, then it builds up and at some point, if that reservoir fills, then it's gonna come out no matter what. And it can come out in explosive, unpredictable ways. Um, uh, as I said, I, I think I said, that was the first time I'd been out of the country. First time away from my parents for any length of time, and then maybe a week or two here or there. Um, that's, I wouldn't say home, homesickness would really describe the whole thing. It was like having everything niche apart. Everything I knew, basically, other than uh, the fact that I spoke English around the other guys and we could relate to common things and some of the music we listened to. But I, I was away from everything. And it wasn't like I had chosen to go. I mean, I was drafted. I, I, well, I chose to report. It wasn't like I chose to volunteer to serve. Uh, initially, so I, I felt like it was that opportunity was kind of to be in that situation and not have done it voluntarily. It was even more of a bruise or more of a damage. Uh, they hadn't had enough, hadn't had a choice in it, um, and then not having, uh, not being around girls or women in normal circumstances. I didn't have a chance to do anything that I would have, I could have done here, and so I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to talk to them. I didn't, I didn't even know how to uh, 
on that. Talk a good game as far as sex. It was like, that. Yeah, here's the money. That's it. Um, I knew that was a handicap. I knew that, that was problematic, but I did the best I could in the situation. Not that I was proud of it, but felt like I did. It was like I didn't have a choice. I didn't have, well, I didn't have enough choices. I hope that answers. One choice that you did have that ended up being very smart, and it's early on, is he was told by one of the officers that if you if you uh, signed up, was it for two or three years? If you yeah. if you took it, was it for three? If you when he had been drafted, he's going to Vietnam. They, there was a scene where they said to you, "You're going to be in the infantry unless you decide to sign up for three years." and you have a chance of taking this aptitude test and maybe testing out of the infantry. Is that about, am I describing it? Well, I'll sort of, right? Okay, thank yeah, yeah. <laughs> you. Because it's a turning point and it's probably why you made it back. Right. Three, three days in the, in the Army, I was in orientation where they sent me before basic training while you're waiting to be assigned to basic, basic training. They marched this information to Building, we're all the same kind of building. You've seen them all, 1950s style buildings, barracks. And they gave us a talk. Um, the fellow said, "I guarantee, let's see, you can you can take a test that will determine your your job in the army. Because not everybody's in the infantry. If you are willing to enlist for three years." The draft service time is two years, so if you enlist for three years, we will guarantee you will get that job that you are qualified to do. So take the test, whatever you're qualified to do, we'll, we'll let you do that job. So I, I, and then he said, I guarantee that if you don't do that, you'll go to Vietnam in the infantry. So, no way, Jose, that's his death warrant. I am not going to go to Vietnam. So I enlisted, took, I took the test, was willing to um, enlist for three years, and I ended up becoming an intelligence analyst, which is basically a, a desk jockey. Hopefully, and it turned out, I was in the headquarters building with the generals and the colonels and all that. So it turned out to be a pretty good decision. And he had to make that on a moment's notice and trust this person. And if you hadn't done well on the test, who knows where you would have been put. So, yeah, Anita. Welcome home. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you made it. I'd like to talk about that point forward when you're engaging with other vets, other traumatized people, and also working in your practice as a counselor. And my sense, just as having lived as an expat, is that upon coming home, it's harder to come home than it is to go out. And you mentioned this uh, on your arrival, the family there, you were home, but you weren't really home. It was different. One big category that I hear from people all the time. Second is, I'm here, I'm me, but I'm not really me anymore. Who am I now? So if I'm not home, and I'm not me, what the hell matters? Is that a common trajectory that you see with people that are traumatized and displaced, or do you see other key types of steps that individuals face? Well, I, I haven't specifically worked with people under the umbrella of the diagnosis of trauma, or specifically trauma or deaths. Most of them who I dealt with were people suffering with drug and alcohol problems and been incarcerated in residential treatment or whatever, and then later on people who had psychiatric disorders. So we didn't focus specifically on that. So I can't say I'm an expert in trauma per se. I can say that there is that kind of a, a disembodiment or disbelief aspect when you're traumatized and put, put out of a situation and put back in a situation, it's hard to adjust. I think the thing for Vietnam vets, the thing for me, and maybe two of other vets who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, or whatever, it's that feeling that you're acknowledged for the sacrifices or what you suffered, that other people who weren't there acknowledge that to you and for you. I didn't feel acknowledged when I got other than 
few members of my family. When I came back to the I didn't feel the knowledge. It's like, it didn't matter. I didn't exist to those people. So I walked down the street. And, and not only that, there were a lot of protests. And I heard rumors. It didn't happen to me because I kept a low profile. You know, veterans were being spit upon and told they were baby killers and all that. And that even aggravated the trauma. It's like they were being traumatized in a different way. All over, well, not all over, but additionally. Um, so I don't know if I answered that very well directly for you, but. Yeah, I was looking through for stages where you acknowledge and you see some transference or some crossover between the people that you are working with as a counselor and some of the stages of experience that you experienced and saw in your fellow returning vets. Mm, yeah, that's, that's a hard one. Now, I, I haven't approached yet group, uh, veterans groups uh, specifically yet, but I think that will be the next one of my next steps to try to connect with them. Yeah, if you have any connections, Anita, you do a lot of public speaking, if anyone does, because I'd love to see him speak at, um, for a vet organization here or any organizations that deal with PTSD because it, it, it seems to be that the consequences of PTSD are, are so similar no matter what the origin of it is. They are the same. Manifest. They are the same. They like are. I said, that pain, that reservoir of pain, definitely, or what the trauma is, the reservoir of pain feels the same, I think, from one person to another. Does writing this book feel like you're closing this chapter, or does it feel like you are being heard now in a way that you weren't decades ago? Well, y yes, the last part, I think, it's another step forward in the journey. It's not. In, it's never ending. It's never ending. It's an ongoing process. The whole, the whole life, my whole life. Did you have another question? Yeah. Go, go ahead, Kelly. Okay. I'm intrigued. But you need to be louder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be such a problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, unlike you, my dear. I have not yet read the book. Obviously, I'm going to buy the book. Um, but I'm hearing talk about being 20 and getting in and going to brothels. And I want to know how did learning about sex, learning about women in Vietnam, how were you able to come home and figure out a road to a relationship with a woman when you had this transactional <coughs> history with women. That's why you have to read the book. Because <laughs> he does yeah. talk about it. Was, it was no simple road to follow. <laughs> Very ill-equipped when you came home. <laughs> I don't know how much in detail that you one, want one to get step, with that. Yeah, one step at a time and not always in the right direction. <laughs> but he is happily married now. Yay! So <laughs> it, it, he does talk about that in the book. Um, yeah, I don't know that you want to go too into to detail with that one. Well, I, I think I think uh, therapy in college uh, with Edith Alpha helped. I mean, that's probably what saved me. I was suicidal at that time. Oh, no. And, uh, if it hadn't been for that, I would have, I wouldn't be here, I don't think. After that, it was starting to study therapy. That began to open the doors. And then working in the first uh, full-time job I had as a therapist, with we brother in the drug and alcohol rehab, and, and participating in the staff meetings where we talked about our feelings. That was a big, that kind of tipped the point for me in the right direction. Not that I was perfect after that. It Not sounds that I'm like now. your educational therapy was just fantastic. I mean, I mean, I didn't know that when you would study therapy, you would get there. Uh, I think that's great. Well, I, 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 I suspect a lot of therapists go into therapy because they need therapy. <laughs> All of them that I know. <laughs> it, it's kind of a I've been interested in it myself. <laughs> I think it's pretty common among therapists. 
Yeah, that was that was the best part of that job. That was the best part of that job for me. It's more like a writing kind of question. Uh, this book's loaded with parody. I mean, there are any windows that are absolutely humorous. And I wonder if that's a survival thing when you were there. There's a parody on the army, a parody on yourself, a parody on, on Vietnam. It's like, you know, those tiny windows and kind of ways of framing what was happening at the moment. And I, because I read them, and I even told you I laughed. I felt guilty that I was laughing. <laughs> really? I did. Yeah. But I was laughing. And I wondered at the time that that's part of going from one day to the next. Well, I, I think it is. You need, that's part of our survival right. strategies. I think we have to have a sense of humor. Yeah, yeah. But and, you have a, and, a, a way of taking it seriously at the same time, Harry. But I think I'm pretty good at sarcasm. But yeah, it's it's the king of sarcasm. Yeah, really I, know, uh, I didn't know that too. <laughs> <laughs> He's the king of sarcasm. Of but everything, <laughs> everything has the potential to get flipped. Right? You know, just like Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. just like that. Just like that. <laughs> Anita? But did you oh, build it? Follow up. Because I'm curious about Ronnie. Did you build it in deliberately, or did it just come back? I think it came naturally, but if, if I saw it, I may have tried to accentuate it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you devil, you! <laughs> Anita? <laughs> well, as Dave said, the book is about politics. We've been trying so hard not to. <laughs> if you can tell, we have skirted around that proverbial landmine. I think it's to our detriment if we don't do that. And I have no idea where you stand day politically. I know where I stand. And well, I'm glad you know where you stand. Yeah, I know where I stand. And I was prompted by something you said in one of your responses. And that was about the disrespect that you suffered upon re-entry to the U.S. By those of us that were protesting the war all the way through and disrespecting people who went into the service to do what the government was telling them to do. So here we are now, mm -hmm. six feet apart, okay, 50 years later or more. And I think that another audience for this book are baby boomers yes. mm -hmm. who are on opposite sides of this question in the 60s, 70s, and so forth. Um, so I want to encourage you to think broadly about the dimensions are to these wars um, and the politics. And we, we did make a decision with the virtual book launch to not let it get political, not so much to offend people that were protesting back in the time, but because things have been so politically charged recently. And it's such a slippery slope when we were doing a, a virtual book launch with some loved ones across the country that are on different parts of the spectrum. Yeah, I can share a little bit about that. Just thought that came up crops up now and then for me. Well, I think we all lived in a cultural soup and in some way we're all victims of that. 
It was bigger than us. Some of us didn't realize it. Some, some of us may have. But it was still a suit that we were swimming in. And when we recognize that, we can start to make decisions to deal with it. Yeah, until we recognize it, we can't do anything about it. Uh, I love that you brought that up. Thank you. Yeah, it would be really wonderful to, to dive deeper into those relationships and the beliefs people have had, and here we are decades later. Yeah. And I think we've got time for one. Anybody, any other questions? Thank you so much for coming out to help him celebrate in his first in-person signing. If you know of any organizations or places that you think he'd be a fabulous speaker for, he's also been on many podcasts for his prior book. So he is booking podcasts at this point. Um, also, we hope besides purchasing a couple of books or one book, we, we hope you're able to do that. Um, sign up for his email list.